Continuing on the bonus lecture series here, we're going to talk about uh, basically setup and hold time constraints. Uh, again, setup and hold time, very familiar to us by this point, are the amount of time the data must remain stable before and after the clock edge. Now let's examine uh, how we model delays in a synchronous environment. Uh, for example, if someone asked you to calculate the amount of time it takes to propagate the, the output from the last flip-flop to the output pin of our design, our chip, our module, what have you, we would say, okay, well that's got to be the clock delay plus the intrinsic nature, the intrinsic clocked-out delay of the flip-flop plus the data delay. Ideally, you shouldn't have any delay between the last flip-flop and your output pin of your module. This good design practice not to put delay here. But say you do, or say there's some routing delay. Say that signal travels a distance that's non-negligible. We have some data delay that's incurred. And so to figure out the actual clocked-out time calculation, not to be confused with the intrinsic clock to out, we say clock delay plus intrinsic plus data delay. Uh, arrival time is typically thought of as the time it takes for a signal to arrive at a given input. That input is relative to what you're looking at. So let's assume that our input relative to this clock arrives in, in, a, in a minimum or a cold corner condition it, it goes from a 0 to a 1 by this time. Uh, in a hot corner or slow condition, a max, it arrives at 0 to 1 here. It takes that long for the input to propagate. Now, in its falling edge, it's the same thing, 1 to 0. But again, min and max, in uh, cold and hot corner. Uh, what that means here is minimum refers to the fastest the timing can operate. Uh, something you might be familiar with is you might have heard about people uh, overclocking their CPUs and they put a bunch of technology on there to cool it down. Well, what they're doing is they're basically cooling down the CPU because the actual technology, the silicon itself, runs faster, actually has less resistance, is a better conductor lower temperatures and it tends to be a poorer conductor at hotter temperatures so we call it minimum timing fastest it can run it and maximum for the slowest when we usually do timing we're typically looking at what's called a typical or room temperature type scenario but as digital designers we have to account for the cold and the hot corners so that we know our chip will function in all environments um, one example here, so we looked at the clock to out, let's look at the clock to in, or input to register. So we have some delay here, some clock one, that's a typo, you can ignore that, but there's some, basically what we're concerned is how long does it take from this clock for the data to arrive at this input pin. So T clock one, the, the time it takes for the clock to arrive at this flip-flop, plus the propagation delay of the, the flip-flop itself, the intrinsic clock to out, plus some finite data delay to connect that. If you add all those up together, you get the data arrival time at register 2 of, for the input pin D. It's how long it takes for the data to propagate from the input to the first to the second flip-flop in the design. Um, this would basically actually be a register to register delay. Now let's talk about Let's let's break this down into the clock arrival time. The clock arrival time is the amount of time it takes from the latch edge, basically let's call the latch edge the insertion point of the clock for now, um, plus some finite delay, which is the routing delay of the clock. <laughs> and that routing delay is based on the clock tree's geometry where it's laid out. And what happens is we want to know when is that clock going to arrive at our flip-flop. This helps us determine setup and hold time characteristics to a greater accuracy. So let's actually now look at the data delay. Let's look at an example here where we have a data input, a data delay, and 
the um, when does the data actually arrive? Well, say we haven't we say our input arrives at the ch in our module our chip what have you at two nanoseconds. And let's say that this is some magical logic that does some amazing things. Um, it takes 13 nanoseconds. So that means we would see that input at 15 nanoseconds. So what we want to think about here is there's the clock arrival time and you think about basically the launch edge. So when does um, the clock arrive relative from the insertion point plus the uh, clock delay and we want to actually use that to determine the actual clock arrival time so again it's pretty basic here looking at this example let's say we our clock arrives at um, 8 nanoseconds and for this example and there's a 0 0.002 nanoseconds or basically two picoseconds clock skew between the clock source and the first flip-flop. Um, basically what that does is that tells us that our actual input arrival um, of the clock uh, and of the data is going to be calculated as follows. Um, source clock edge plus the path delay. Our input will arrive relative to the clock edge at that time. Now we can break this out again as follows. We can basically say that there's two ways to look at this. The clock arrival time, the clock will arrive at, um, at this point in time plus the clock to out plus the data. That's the data arrival time of register 2. Now we can um, rewrite that as follows. The launch edge plus the clock plus T clock 1 plus the clock to out plus data. Again it, it's all basically saying the same thing in as many ways as possible. So let's take this these take these delays we've talked about and let's look at the setup and hold timing. Um, what you see here is there's some intrinsic setup and probably so there's some intrinsic hold. Our data arrives, it must be stable before the clock period, and it must be held stable after. Now what happens if we insert data delay into this design? What we see here is that it shifts our D input over um, and so what happens is we still need to meet the same setup and hold times but what we find here is that X actually ends up being our output our output actually ends up the same but our say our input X is shifted so what happens is uh, we see D get shifted even further so the question is, even with this shift, do we still meet setup and hold? Well, let's uh, let's add another detail here. Let's go ahead and let's say let's look at uh, setup time, uh, relative and hold time with a shifting clock. Okay, so here we can see the clock is the same, and the setup and hold times look like they're met. But say we add the clock delay to that, what does that do? Well here you can tell it looks different. It actually it shifts our data input and it actually shifts when we have to meet timing. The other one shifted whether or not we met timing. This shifts when we have to meet timing. And so the formula for that is going to be setup plus the minimum clock delay. So what we want to know here is the intrinsic setup plus the fastest it will take for that clock to get there. Again, we're looking at the worst case condition here, so we want to look at the fastest something can arrive to make sure that we meet setup. Now, it might not make sense at first, but what's going on here is we have some finite setup delay. And the faster the clocks, the, 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 the longer the uh, clock delay, the more time we have to meet setup. 
So we actually want a, a to test the worst case condition of the setup. We actually want to see the fastest the clock can arrive. What happens is that gives us less extra time to meet setup. As far as hold goes, hold's exactly the opposite. What we're looking at is our hold condition minus the longest it will take for the hold signal to arrive. And so what that means is we need to hold that signal even longer now relative to our destination clock edge. And so this actually makes it more challenging once we add clock skew. So what we want to do here is we want to start adding all of these features together. So again, with, a, with basically a net delay, our, 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 our waveform looks like so. So with some input data delay, we have the following equations, which we talked about before. Our setup plus our maximum net delay, our hold minus our fastest net delay, net being our logic or some routing delay. Now let's add in the clock delay. And so we get a clearer picture of how our clock skew and our data delays, our, our combination logic and routing delays can affect setup and hold. So again, our data delay shifted, our, our net delay shifted when the data arrived, as you remember data arrival. And our, basically we saw X come in to, to basically we, we represent it with a D we see that X shows up at pin D around here. Now, that affects our setup and hold, but what happened is our clock is also shifted. And so what you see is our setup and hold gets shifted also. So what happens is now we have to meet this setup. Well, that becomes a little simpler now, um, but our hold also gets shifted. So what you can see here is that our clock and our data delay tend to affect where our setup and hold times line up. So again, a simple global propagation delay example here is our clock plus our data plus some delay. We've looked at this example before, but just another graphic to illustrate global propagation delay. So now We've looked at a simple example here, but we want to kind of put it all together. We want to talk about Slack. Slack is the way a synthesis tool knows whether or not you can meet the desired clock frequency. And so we think of this in terms of positive Slack and negative Slack. And so what's going to happen here is we're going to look at positive Slack as being how much time we have left over. And with left over time, that means we can either A, add some more fancy stuff to our logic, or B, increase the clock frequency. Uh, basically what we're looking for is critical paths. And critical paths are any paths with negative slack.